Tell us when you realized you had something other than just an accidental death. Sure. Uh, it was probably a couple days into it. Uh, we were still at the house, and we could not get the machine itself to fail in any way. It seemed to be working perfectly. Uh, things just weren't adding up with, first of all, the 911 call. I'm sure you've heard that before. It just didn't seem right to me from the get-go. So, What was your interaction with Scott like from the beginning? Was it sort of strange the way that he was acting uh, with you guys, or was it something that you would expect to see in a case like this? It's not what I expected. Um, I expected to find a person that was very distraught, very upset, crying. I didn't get that. I got a person that I perceived to be very cold, calculating, uh, just didn't seem to really care that his wife had just passed away. When uh, did you realize that this was a case where you knew this guy killed his wife? I mean, when did you realize that that, that, that was what you had here? Uh, that's easy. Uh, the, the day we actually viewed the video surveillance camera at home, uh, it was July 15th. I'll never forget it. Um, I had a pit in my stomach when I started watching that and saw him come at 8.32 in the morning. And then when I saw him later on the video wearing a pair of shorts, and that for me cinched it. Uh, I'm sure that's what cinched it for the jury as well. I mean, was that the key piece of evidence in, the, in this whole case, considering it is a circumstantial case where you can't, you know, you don't have video of him doing it in the, in the weight room or something like that? I think it's one of two. I think that's one of the big ones, but I also think uh, Dr. Wagner's information also, to me, was very important. Was there any time during the trial where you thought, you know, there's a chance that we may not get the, the verdict that we want? Was there any point like that for you? In the actual trial itself? Not really in the trial. Um, Randy Miller and I, the other detective that I we worked with, we would talk about this case every day since this happened, and we would go back and forth. We're going to get a verdict, you know, a good one. No, we're not. You know, is it enough? Is it not enough? We would just go back and forth, back and forth. And I really thought through the entire trial, you know, although I had a biased opinion, I always thought, you know, it just makes sense. It's just common sense, you know. But, I mean, you never know. You never know with a jury. You know, it could have come back you know, not guilty. Have you ever worked a case like this before? Uh, a homicide like this? Yeah, no. Circumstances? No, never. What was it like going through that? I mean, you, you said it yourself. Some days you, you were pretty confident and other days you weren't. What was it like having to constantly think about this and go back and forth? That's very stressful. Very stressful on your body, on yourself, on your family. Um, I would, you know, not eat, not sleep very well. I had many sleepless nights over this case. Um, I just you know, would think about this case constantly, I'd wake up 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning and start thinking about it and think about it all day long and yeah. worry, what could I do better? What did I not do? What could I do? What did I do? You know, what do I need to do today? And was a lot of that because you, you knew the family that was behind it who, who maybe, uh, you know, if they didn't get the verdict they want, how devastating that could be for them? Um, I didn't really know the entire family. Uh, I was very close to Christine. Uh, she and I spoke so often, um, I really want to do this not only for her but for Dylan because I had spoken with Dylan several times and realized what a good kid he is. He's a really nice young man. I've never heard anybody ever say you know anything negative about him or Lisa, and it just it was just tragic f from the start. Before we get to, to what happened yesterday, for people who weren't as engulfed in this case as you were, there are many people who were as engulfed in this case as you. What kind of person were we dealing with in Scott Pattison, in, in your opinion? Uh, a very egocentric, self-centered sociopath, I guess is the best way to call him. Um, he cared about nothing but himself. Um, you know, the day his wife died, just didn't seem to care. You know, just very, very a cold person. Every time we talked to him in the first interview, I never met the man before until I interviewed him that time. Never seen him, didn't know him interviewed him and every time I asked him a question it was you know how'd you find Lisa how it was Lisa's problems with her neck well this is what happened to me this is what I did you know and I just just it was always about him and, and in your eyes did he you think he planned this out did he know he was going to do that that morning I believe he planned it out yes yes it wasn't just like a fit of rage or something like that. I don't believe so no no I the reason why I say that is because number one his girlfriend was out of town she had a perfect alibi. She was gone. Dylan was gone out of the house. He was working. He knew he could be there alone with her. Uh, last night, I'm sure you're nervous going in, into that courtroom before the verdict is sure. read. What's going through your mind before that's read? Um, please, God, give us a good verdict. Make justice happen. That and, was. And then when it is read, what, what's that feeling like, knowing that... You guys did your work, and you got the verdict you wanted, and that family sitting behind you was getting what they wanted. Um, 
first of all, it was relief, just you know, an exhale of relief, and then it's kind of melancholy a little bit because it's not going to bring Lisa back. It's not going to bring her back, and this is maybe the best thing we could do other than that.